These are the familiar images of Ulster's Protestants. Visual cliches used to convey a monolithic intransigence. Media caricatures which are a tiny fraction of the truth about a remarkable people. The Ulster Scots, or Scots-Irish, were America's first frontiersmen. They gave the United States ten presidents and a democratic philosophy. They built cities like Pittsburgh, places where they willingly merged in a multiracial population. Over four centuries, they have imposed on a quarter of Ireland their own pattern of society. But integration, which was easy in America, in Ireland seems impossible. With the Scots-Irish, more than with most other people, yesterday is reflected in today. History is as fresh as the morning news. The Scots-Irish story begins in the Scottish lowlands, from where in the early 17th century they began to emigrate in large numbers to the north of Ireland. From the Scottish borders came one of the most important components of the Scots-Irish, the riding families. Armstrongs, Johnstons, Bells, Grahams, violent outlaws who lived by raiding across the border into England. In the high moorlands of Liddesdale is Hermitage Castle, guardhouse of the bloodiest valley in Britain, according to a border historian. It was from strongholds like this that the better off border thieves could defy the power of government, Scots or English. Mail home is one of the many Peel Towers which dot the border country. It belonged to the Pringles, one of the most notorious of the feuding clans of the eastern borders. George MacDonald Fraser has written a history of these border families. In the great wars between England and Scotland, Edward I and Robert the Bruce and Wallace, this countryside took a terrible beating. For generations almost, it was impossible to live normally, to farm peacefully. And the people who lived here, both in England and in Scotland, took to robbery for a living. In fact, what they did was systematic gangsterism. They lived by cattle stealing, by kidnapping, by holding to ransom, and by the protection racket which they invented and which they called by a name which has passed into the language blackmail. And this went on even when the wars between England and Scotland were over. The people had got into the way of living by plunder and they ran raids from England into Scotland, from Scotland into England. Sometimes the 
men from the two sides of the borders would combine and they became known as the border reavers reaver meaning a robber a cattle rustler and at the same time through this life of crime because that's what it was they became extremely skillful guerrilla fighters scouts frontiersmen when the war broke out again as sometimes it did you would find that the people from this countryside became the scouts and light horsemen for the English or Scottish armies. It was only when James I came to the throne that the border was pacified. Until that time, they lived in towers like this one, which are very strong places, well fortified, and in time of trouble, they would get their cattle inside and defend themselves against all comers. James was determined to put a stop to this and he had the borders pacified in a very rough fashion an awful lot of people were killed others were sent to the low countries where they served as mercenaries but most of them whole tribes whole families were shipped to Northern Ireland James the first idea was that they would settle down peacefully as farmers but being what they were which was very skillful guerrilla fighters and robbers by nature, they formed a very hard core. Um, you can say that they were probably the best frontier fighters in Britain, possibly in Europe. And th these were the people who were the sort of center, if you like, of the Scotch-Irish settlers in Ulster and of course later in the United States. Scots who came to Ireland had undergone a totally transforming experience, the Scottish Reformation. Did not need a priest or a king to think for him. This was the beginning of the great radical tradition of the Scots-Irish. The majority of the Scots emigrants were tenant farmers, neither horse thieves nor religious fanatics. They left Scotland because with a rapidly rising population and greatly increased rents, the land could no longer support them. Cattle were virtually the only wealth of the Scottish countrymen, and in the emigration to Ireland they were as important as people. From the grassmen of Ayrshire and Aberdeen, the Scots-Irish droving tradition began. Many of the Ulster settlers came from rich lands in Lanarkshire and Wigton. They were skilled grain growers, and this was a vital factor in the success of the Ulster plantation. These emigrants were so numerous that one writer compared them to swarms of bees rising from the fields of Scotland. Today a tourist ferry follows the route of the emigrant ships of the 17th century. Then the passengers were mainly peasant farmers. A few brash townsmen from privileged royal boroughs like Ayr blacksmiths, masons and carpenters, though most of the craftsmen for Ulster came from England. And there were also some whose background didn't bear examination. Preachers came as well, eager to convert the new land to a godly discipline. When I landed in Ireland, I met some men parting from their cups and all things smelling of garlic. My prejudice was confirmed against that land. The next day, traveling towards Bangor, I met, unexpectedly, with so sweet a peace. Oh, Lord. 
Lord, I feel my blessing upon me. There is such joy in my heart. Thou is dear to me here in barbarous Ireland, as thou wert in my ain dear land. A drink there, eh? And what might you be? A Scot like yourself, Robert Allen, for Ayrton. Aye? Aye. Now come for the yards of down to draw timber for Lord Ochiltree. What do you ken, Lord Ochiltree? <laughs> do we ken Andrew Stewart, blacksmith, eh? Aye, we ken him, Teamster. We're his tenants. This here is Lancey Armstrong. Armstrong? For the borders, eh? Aye. I'll say no more. <laughs> what do you mean, stranger? Oh, that he kens the borders. The Christians there, all horse thieves are hanging. Oh, yeah, bastard! Oh, easy, easy! Hey, I'll easy. You easy. Didn't hang Armstrong as they drown them to save their yeah, lives. Yeah, that, that is enough, stranger. You shut your mouth and tack your ale. I was joking. Come on, here, drink with me, Lancey Armstrong. What are uh, you in the wagon? What are you in the wagon, eh? Oh, wondrous sight. Sassenach, come out. You're among friends. Holy mother, it's a leper. A leper. They mean a poor English carpenter, fair frozen with the Irish rain. <laughs> Doesn't he put his head above this sack, sign my left? Oh, come in, man. Take some ale. Take the ale, man. Come on, get some warrants. Hey, he's cried Baptist Christmas. <laughs> See, I fear to lose his head like the Baptist in Holy Writ, eh? If the wood can, then I get him. The wolves will. Wood can? Be they demons? Be they demons? <laughs> How long have you been in Ireland, Carpenter? Four weeks. That's four weeks and three days since I took ship from Chester to the Nuries. A month in Ireland and you've never heard of the wood can? Forests are full of them. Irish outlaws. And they're all <laughs> papists to a man. And they hate nothing more than an Englishman. And a Protestant. Jesus, your mercy, I would I was back in Norfolk. <laughs> Don't it be a feared man? Drink up your ale. Aye, we're in same need of good carpenters like you. We'll look after you. <laughs> God's curse on the English. The old enemy. What good are they to us here now? The fear to go to the fields to plough the land, and the dare not raise cattle in case the Irish steal them. We need the English to put the build the tunes to civilise this land. Wind and piss, that's the English. If it wasn't for us Scots folks building and ploughing and sowing and reaping, the folk would starve. <laughs> Aye, and the whole plant in Ulster would just wither away. Feel me! Mary Ellen, mark it quick! Why don't you sit yourself down, man? Nice guy. Uh, this is poor Philem O'Quinn, a mere Irishman. Says the Scots have taken his father's land and made him a beggar. Is that no right, Philemy? Kincha. Betrain Tilchamora, Igma Hinchorom. August hour, 
agus ala glenadif agus kahadish flauna in ena gloriha salarevo and kagoan agus got hanag nagal what i says his father had muckle lands and corn and cattle and feasted with kings oh no that was before the <laughs> lying war and the coming of the stranger guys a pair of decent biddy oor feel me now hunger to death when he can't eat me eh drunkenness wantonness malingering why do you bide here in a fine summer's day when God's work's to be done? A snowy idling and blethering and blaspheming will build Zion in this barbarous land. be without his wife. She's got her head screwed on. Come on, farmer, come on. You've sold your horse. You're not a horse Protestant anymore. Hurry up, Weaver. You haven't sold your cloth, Weaver. Trade is bad. Very bad. Now, the news. Hold on. There's Arthur Patterson. Arthur, my friend. Where's your fiddle? No music today. Never mind. We've got news. Good news. All the way from America. <laughs> from America? That's the place. All the land you need. Work for them that wants to. And food and whiskey for <laughs> everybody. <laughs> you want to stay here? God forsaken Ulster. Hasn't been a harvest for five years. Decent Protestants dying of hunger. Aye, oh, that's true enough. First rate, Weaver. In America, you get 100 shillings a whap. What's your name? John Smiley. Well, John Smiley, I've got special news for you. Your lease is nearly up, isn't that so? I know your landlord and his agent too. Next time round, your rent will be doubled. <laughs> Do you want to do that? That's if you're lucky. Some papist may overbid you and throw your children out on the road. Good people. Good people. I told you I had good news. Here it is. In the Gazette. To the printers of the Belfast Newsletter. It comes from Donegal. Donegal, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Gentlemen, I write from a land like unto that promised to the children of Israel in the desert. This is the best country in the world for a poor man. The land is fertile and free. Or very cheap. <laughs> very cheap. For them that does not want the cares of the land, there is work in plenty. A weaver can earn one hundred pounds a year. <laughs> well, that's for you, McCulloch, eh? Listen to what this wise man says next. I came here on a fair voyage with that humane and worthy Captain James Taylor in his stout and commodious vessel, the Sally. 
much obliged, sir. Come now, you timorous fellas. The Sully sails for Philadelphia in a month. Who be on it? It's well for you, Captain. But where's the passage money to be found in times like these? Passage money, says he. Who spoke of passage money? All you have to do, and you may not believe this, gentlemen, is sign this paper. The British colonies of North America offered a fresh opportunity. Many were ready to sign away their freedom for the next four years and become indentured servants in exchange for a passage to the New World. And you'll be on the high seas within the month. Hey, we were. I'll sail with you. Then sign, man. The ship's nigh full. I'm a weaver. I'll pay my fare. Go on, get out of the way, son. Of our bondage. As Egypt was to the Israelites of old. Here, we Presbyterians cannot be magistrates or even postmen. <laughs> Unless we take communion in the house of idolaters. Here it is not lawful for us to marry in our ain kirk. For we will be called fornicators and our children bastards. Brethren, let us depart from here. For God has appointed a new country for us to dwell in. Let us be free from these pharaohs, these wreckers of rent and screwers of titles. And let us go on to the land of Canaan. For we are the Lord's own people. And he shall divide the ocean before us. Scots emigrated in the 17th century to the north of Ireland. These Ulster Scots or Scots-Irish built towns and roads in Ireland and from a land of swamp and forest they created a rich province. But by the 18th century they were again on the move, this time to the British colonies of North America. The lands which were to become the United States. Father, on the 31st of May we lost sight of Ireland. We had our full allowance of bread and water only for the first fortnight. First we had a southwest wind which drove us so far north that our weather became extremely cold. On July the 12th we espied a mountain of ice of prodigious size. On the 13th our weather became more moderate and on August the 1st became extremely warm. <laughs> on the 10th day of August, our allowance of bread came to two and a half pounds per week to each passenger. Next week, we had only one pound and a half, 
and the next 12 days we lived on two biscuits. Nineteenth of August. Hunger and thirst reduced us to the last extremity. Our ship was truly a spectacle of horror. Never a day but one or two were put overboard. Many killed themselves by drinking salt water. Their own urine was a common drink. Yet our captain showed not the least remorse or pity. day, the Lord was pleased to send the greatest shower of rain I ever saw, which was the means of preserving our lives. <laughs> On the 1st of September, we find ourselves in 40 fathoms of water, and next morning, about 8 o'clock, we saw land. The crossing had lasted 14 weeks and 5 days. The people of Upper Octorara in Pennsylvania celebrate the 4th of July. Their Scots-Irish ancestors were in the forefront of the American Revolution and earlier still, they were among the first of the pioneers to cut their way into the Pennsylvanian wilderness. The first pastor of Octorara Presbyterian Church in 1724 was Adam Boyd from Ballymena in County Antrim. The church has been the centre of a strong patriotic tradition since then. In the late 18th century, the gospel of revolution was preached here and the soldiers for Washington's army recruited. American patriotism at Octorara does not conflict with a strong Scots-Irish identity. Most early immigrants from Ulster went to Pennsylvania. There, the Quaker government gave them the freedom of worship denied them in Ireland. The first Scots-Irish settlements in Pennsylvania were along the Octorara Creek, which runs into the Susquehanna River, southwest of Philadelphia. From here, they began to move in a northwesterly direction along the line of the Susquehanna, pushing the frontier deeper into the wilderness. Presbyterian churches, Upper Octorara, Middle Octorara, Fags Manor, Donegal, Derry, Paxtang, marked the line of their advance.
They found a rolling, fertile plain on the banks of the Susquehanna and christened it Donegal. After working their indenture, the Scots-Irish set out for the frontier, 40 or 50 miles west of Philadelphia. There, they began immediately to clear the ground for crops. The Ulsterman often claimed his land by tomahawk right. He cut his initials on a few trees, then cut a circle around the bark to kill the trees. The price for land was low, but to the tight-fisted Scots-Irish, that was academic. They refused to pay anything, saying God owned Pennsylvania, and he clearly intended it for Ulster Presbyterians. Life for the settler's wife was hard. She ground the meal to make cornbread. She spun the flax for the family's clothing. She worked in the fields beside her man. At the same time, she bore 10 or 15 children. Your lessons, the minister's coming today. Willie, the good book. It was the settler's wife who educated the children, something which the Scots-Irish, no matter how far from civilization, thought very important. Nathaniel Smiley, Burnhead Farm, Gatehouse of Fleet, Stewarty of Kilcubri, Kingdom of Scotland. Clearing the land of trees was back-breaking, and there was a great temptation to live by hunting the wild turkey, deer and bear which abounded. Unlike the meticulous Germans, the Scots-Irish fell the trees and ploughed round the stumps instead of clearing the land properly. Homemade whiskey was important at the frontier. When the settler was far from a market, he turned his extra grain into whiskey, which he then traded to passing merchants for guns and farm tools. Whiskey also made a harsh life a lot more tolerable. <laughs> Catch and wait, Mace Johnny. Aye, are, sir. We're staying in our jug for a while. Johnny, we want good music from you. Shall we drop a rosin the bow? Here's to the old land and the new land. 
God grant a whole heart to both. The settlers longed for company, especially of their own people, still speaking Ulster dialect. Neighbours gathered to help clear land, build a house or bring in the harvest. And a lively party resulted. Mary, can I get the other hand? Aye, there's another one. Thank you. Very well, John. I am indeed. How are you? Not too bad. Good. 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 Seven years since I came, and I've ten acres cleared and corn and four acres this year. Don't plant your corn to the dogwood flowers. Indian talk. Who ever saw a good Indian crop? Well, what about the Dutch then? Oh. Dutch? Every Sabbath our preacher goes on. Dutch, Dutch, Dutch. Nobody like the Dutch. With their fields all cleared and their big fat cattle. I'm sick hearing in Kirk about the Dutch working from dawn till dusk every day bar the Sabbath. Right, see the preacher. Everybody well. Hello. How are you? 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 How are you doing? Hello. Well, say, Grace. <clears throat> the eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat. The Ulster pioneers were an extrovert people given to drinking, arguing, singing and dancing. The broad horizons of America and their new sense of freedom gave a fresh exuberance to their Calvinist natures. As I walked out one May morning down by the riverside, I cast my eyes around me and an Irish girl I spied. Her cheeks were red and rosy, and coal black was her hair. How costly were the jewels my Irish girl did wear. The fiddler Arthur Patterson is buried in Donegal churchyard among the Pedans, Andersons and Agnews of the first Ulster settlement. Their younger sons and daughters moved on to new lands. With the eldest son inheriting the family farm, they had no choice. Today, the broad Susquehanna is a pleasure ground for Pennsylvanian holidaymakers. But in the early 18th century, it was a barrier which halted the Scots-Irish pioneers. Beyond the river lay the rich, empty Cumberland Valley. <laughs> 